Uh, good morning. Uh, we're going to start our program. Uh, this event is titled Celebrating Our Academic Societies, and I'm absolutely delighted uh, for those of us uh, who are here uh, at the Health Education Campus uh, building in our tiered lecture hall, and those of us who are joining from afar, uh, welcome to our uh, weekend of alumni activities. Um, I really am excited by this particular uh, celebration and activity and the rest of the day that will take us through the evening and then tomorrow uh, as well. This is a very special uh, moment as we're all attempting to come out of our pandemic lifestyle and back into gatherings. Um, I'm uh, delighted that we're going to take the focus today on looking at and celebrating our academic societies. Um, and to honor some of the faculty here who most emulate the strong characteristics of our society namesakes, um, who were in, the, in and of themselves remarkable uh, physicians. And I'm really excited that we have uh, the team that we have today. We're gonna take you through all of our academic societies and uh, learn a little bit about them and have a faculty member speak um, in their regard. So I'm Stan Gerson, uh, uh, just been appointed uh, as the uh, Dean of the uh, School of Medicine, spent the last year as, as acting and uh, am still managing my responsibilities with the Comprehensive Cancer Center. I just want to up, up, update you very briefly about where the school is, what we're doing. We graduated our class of 2021 live, thank goodness. Um, tomorrow we'll have a celebration for the class of 2020. They can come back and have their live activity. The class of 2021 was 204 graduates back in May. They're off doing their residencies, their postdocs, whatever they're up to. Um, uh, we remain uh, well ranked um, and delighted with how high quality the residencies that our uh, students match to. Uh, and the incoming class of 2025 has 200, 217 uh, new students across our three major efforts, the university program, the college program, and the MD-PhD program. Um, they're excited off to running, and the buzz around here, uh, for those of you not on campus every day, is just remarkable. Um, a lot of the success that we have in our recruitment, in our graduation, really does relate to our six academic societies. This is a program that started in 2003, shortly after we moved into the WR2 curriculum. Each of our societies is named after a respected school of medicine graduate or faculty member. We're very proud of the principles of excellence, uh, commitment, scholarship, community awareness, global impact that the named physicians represent. And we teach that to our medical students. And today we'll ce celebrate those individuals and our faculty who proudly follow in their footsteps. We have gradually expanded the activities under the umbrella of the Academic Society program. Uh, and this fall, uh, we expanded to our sixth society after Vice Dean for Education, Lee Elogio, advocated strongly for the fact that we need to shrink the number of students in each society so that each society could really uh, create the environment needed to give proper attention uh, to our students. And I'm incredibly appreciative of each of the deans of our societies for their efforts. I suspect I have no idea how much work they put into this. Every student enters by random assignment into one of our six societies and stays in that society till graduation. What they do and how they do it, of course, evolves. They provide the continuity acting sort of orthogonal, if you will, to our education programs that progress from the IQ inquiry small groups um, through all of our learning blocks, our six pathways through independent study, through the clinical clerkships, through the investigative thesis on the elective efforts in the fourth year, and then prepare our students for their launching off to their residency programs, which is after all at the end of the day what we want for every student. For the duration of that medical student experience, our societies are individualized by our six amazing society deans. Each dean acts as a mindful coach, guiding each student uh, over their four or five or even more years of continuum of medical education. 
they give uh, this, uh, uh, given the special role of the society deans, uh, their best uh, uh, position to advise and advocate for each student as they move on to their next activity. Um, I have some personal indirect experience with the societies because my son uh, James Gerson and his wife Danielle Burstein, both class of 2012, cherish their time as members of the Wern Society and they remain closely uh, connected to the fellow students in that society, so I know that the connectivity really does work. Since I'm not an expert, I did ask their society dean, uh, Steve Riccanati uh, of the Wern Society, to comment. And so I'm going to take advantage of an email he sent me back. Um, I asked for one or two sentences, a little bit longer, but we know Steve. Um, since we've shifted, he commented, to a student-centered form of medical education, teams, no syllabi, pass-fail, which are my, our president asked me about, and I assured him it was the right way to go, essay tests, research, uh, where students feel um, sometimes out of bounds and they have to get to know how do they expand their knowledge base, how do they learn better, more efficiently. The society deans uh, and academic societies create a smaller community where everyone feels valued, heard, supported. It's the job of the society dean to facilitate those connections over their expended, extended five-year period of time, four-year period of time. It's our job to, to train our junior colleagues um, how to be a mentee, how to seek out mentors, how to advocate for themselves, how to uh, reflect honestly on their own performance and improve it, how to engage in self-improvement and to maintain a growth mindset throughout that continuum. These are skills that they need here and they certainly are going to need them as teachers, clinicians, researchers um, throughout their future residency and beyond careers. For the program today, celebrating our six societies, I asked each society dean to briefly review uh, the namesake physician of their incredible and, and their incredible impact on medicine and why they were chosen, and then introduce a faculty member who closely follows in the footsteps of these amazing individuals. You know, that would be a sort of hard act to follow, so I'm really looking forward to your comments. Um, I really am. Uh, I think uh, we will be nothing short than overwhelmed. Uh, by the present-day champions of the principles presented by our societies. Um, I'm really quite proud of this uh, wonderful tradition uh, that I've inherited um, uh, in, in the academic societies. So without further ado, I'm going to turn uh, things over and let um, Todd Ottisman, Dean of the Blackwell McKinley Society, be the MC uh, for the rest of the uh, hour. Thank you. Todd. Thank you, Dean Gerson. Uh, my name is Todd Otteson, and I'm a pediatric otolaryngologist at Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital, uh, and as was mentioned, the dean for Blackwell McKinley Society. So I get to tell you about two amazing women in medicine and then introduce another. Uh, Emily Blackwell was a graduate of the School of Medicine in 1854. She was the second woman to graduate from the School of Medicine and the third to graduate in the United States. Along with her sister Elizabeth Blackwell and Maria Zakskuska, she founded, they founded the New York Infirmary for Women and Children, as well as the Women's Medical College in New York, where she was dean for over 30 years. She was really known and renowned for her surgical skills, for her passion for women's health, uh, and for medical education, and specifically also nursing education. She was very patient-centered and uh, also student-focused. Lisa McKinley was a 1987 graduate of the School of Medicine, was an internist at Metro Health Medical Center. She was a Robert Wood Johnson clinical scholar and the inaugural dean of the Blackwell Society. And was, uh, the society was renamed in her honor as well as the Blackwell McKinley Society. Lisa's practice as a clinician and teacher embodied both the science and the art of medicine. She knew that physicians work in story, the gathering and the telling. She taught that by telling their stories, physicians become better healers. When speaking in public, Dr. McKinley preferred to go last so she could tell a story and let the students always know it's going to be okay. 
Lissa's example as a humanistic clinician, a caring teacher, and a dedicated mentor serve as the legacy that continues to shape the work of medical educators at Case Western Reserve. I do my best when I channel my inner Emily Blackwell and Lissa McKinley to be the most humanistic and compassionate physician, surgeon, mentor, and educator that I can possibly be, and hopefully teach and mentor my students likewise. I'd now like to introduce Dr. Tiffany Hodges, who is a neurosurgeon at University Hospitals and who embodies these attributes and is being recognized today. So, Dr. Hodges. Thank you, Todd, for that introduction. So my name is Tiffany Hodges, and I am an assistant professor of neurosurgery here at University Hospitals in Cleveland, and associate residency program director of our neurosurgery program, subspecializing in neurosurgical oncology. I also serve on the executive committee of our Congress of Neurological Surgeons. I received my bachelor's degree in neuroscience and behavioral biology from Emory University in 2005, and my medical degree in neurosurgical residency training at Duke University. I then completed a neurosurgical oncology fellowship at MD Anderson, where my previous research focused on brain tumor immunotherapy and clinical trial development for patients with malignant gliomas and brain metastases. My current research interests involve brain tumor epidemiology and clinical outcomes after therapy. Now, in terms of my career as a tumor neurosurgeon and how it aligns with the society's namesake, I gleaned from the founding father of modern-day neurosurgery, Dr. Harvey Cushing, who stated, without such classification of intracranial tumors, the bedside diagnosis must remain obscure, the preferential treatment cannot be standardized, and the prognosis will be wholly a matter of guesswork. This statement embodies the essence of neurosurgical oncology, which is a surgical subspecialty that involves the removal of benign and malignant tumors of the brain, spine, and peripheral nerves. It is not uncommon that I encounter a patient, for example, who comes into the emergency room with a massive headache. An MRI of the brain reveals a ring-enhancing lesion, and subsequent pathology after craniotomy and resection shows a glioblastoma. A patient without any warning is now bombarded with a cancer diagnosis where quantity and quality of life is extremely important, or both extremely important. Taking care of patients who are diagnosed with such a life-changing disease where median survival is slightly over 14 months is what inspired me to pursue a career in neurosurgical oncology. And in that regard, I have been committed to not only treating patients with this disease, but also unveiling effective therapeutic targets for malignant brain tumors. My prior research interests involved investigating therapeutic agents targeting malignant brain neoplasms. And this research was primarily focused on brain tumor immunotherapy, which is a unique opportunity that exploits the patient's own immune system to specifically target tumor tissue. I have extensive research experience in neuroimmunology including work completed at the Surgical Neurology Branch of the National Institutes of Health and in the Duke Brain Tumor Immunotherapy Program. However, during my Surgical Neuro-Oncology Fellowship at MD Anderson, I worked on the development of an immunotherapeutic strategy called STAT-3, which can target malignant glioma and brain metastasis with the goal of reducing cancer mortality. We submitted an IND utilizing this immunotherapeutic strategy to the FDA and this trial was subsequently opened as a phase one study. After fellowship, I moved here and came to University Hospitals of Cleveland Case Western School of Medicine to further explore my research interests in the epidemiology of glioblastoma via utilization of the National Cancer Center database in order to evaluate the clinical, genetic, and metabolic profile of these patients. But in addition, we know that there are disparities evident in cancer care including patient access to tertiary care centers, access to clinical trial enrollment, financial toxicities of cancer treat treatments, and the list goes on. It is important that we identify and understand what those factors are and figure out ways to improve that access. Indeed, I have published on the socioeconomic and healthcare access factors that affect the outcome of glioblastoma and gliosarcoma patients. 
It has been recently shown that for a substantial proportion of brain tumor survivors and their families, the process of survivorship is considerably distressing experience, almost equivalent to PTSD. And this is the piece that certainly drew me to this career and aligns with both Dr. Blackwell and Dr. McKinley's fervor in humanism and medicine. It is at this moment that yes, I know I am a physician, and yes, I am a neurosurgeon. However, when I meet a patient during a vulnerable time in their lives of surgery and diagnosis, I know that this is the first step of a significant journey of this patient and their family's lives. I treat each patient with dignity, compassion, and respect. Each patient deserves the highest quality care. I follow them for the long haul, spend time explaining their surgical plan. Do they require an awake craniotomy where we test the patient's speech and motor function while we take out a brain tumor? Do I do a laser ablation technique to burn the tumor? or a terional craniotomy for resecting the brain tumor. I also discuss their post-operative care, tumor board recommendations, their multidisciplinary treatment, making sure that we have all teams on deck to get them to their appointments. I watch them get back to their lives with their loved ones, get them to their child's graduation ceremony, get married or run a marathon. Indeed, Dr. Harvey Cushing stated that, I would like to see the day when somebody would be appointed surgeon somewhere who had no hands for the operative part is the least part of the work. <laughs> the society also emphasizes a comprehensive support system for students to help them master the academic and professional skills required to be a physician. In my career, I teach residents how to operate and take care of complex neurosurgical patients, teach students and residents about normal neuroanatomy and how tumors can change that anatomy and cause deficits. In addition, I perform complex neurosurgical surgeries in the community and educate caregivers and healthcare professionals on the neurosurgical care of these patients, providing access to patients who may not be able to come to the main campus. Dr. McKinley's passion for humanism and medicine also led to the Healer's Art Curriculum and Cancer Survivorship Elective at The Gathering Place, which provides a safe space for patients and families to support each other with their personal stories and experiences. Certainly, many of our cancer patients receive another portion of their healing there when it comes to support. Delivering impactful and effective care is not mutually exclusive with giving compassionate care. This is certainly a great honor to be recognized as a physician embodying, embodying the tenets of humanism and professionalism of the Blackwell McKinley Society. Indeed, my hope is to advance the field of neurosurgery by initiating clinical trials, developing innovative tools, educating the next generation of neurosurgeons, and providing access to impactful and compassionate care. Thank you. And now I will introduce Jill Azok to talk about her society's namesake. Thank you, Tiffany. That was phenomenal. Thanks so much for those remarks. I'm Jill Azok, the Dean of the Satcher Society. I'm a pediatric hospitalist over at UH Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital. I'm also a case grad, and both my husband and I were in the Satcher Society. Dr. David Satcher grew up on a farm outside of Atlanta. When he was two, he contracted whooping cough, and a black physician, Dr. Jackson, told his parents that he likely would not survive. However, Dr. Jackson spent the day with his family. Dr. Satcher credits this hearing about this experience as inspiring him to become a physician. During his time at Morehouse College, he was active in the civil rights movement and was arrested multiple times. He's a case double alumnus graduating with an MD PhD in 1970 and was elected to AOA. He was a former president of Meharry Medical College in Nashville and the former director of the CDC. He was also a four-star admiral in the US Public Health Service Commission Corps, but what he's best known for is US Surgeon General under both Presidents Clinton and George W. Bush. Today, he directs the National Center for Primary Care at the Morehouse School of Medicine in Atlanta and is a vocal advocate for addressing disparities in healthcare. I am pleased to introduce Dr. Edward Barksdale, who exemplifies the qualities of Dr. Satcher and is being honored today. Jill, thank you so much. Dr. Gerson, Dr. Gerberding, 
fellow society, fellow society deans, members of the audience, and those of you who are here on Livecast, welcome. I'm absolutely delighted to join you this morning. I feel I'm Ed Barksdale. I am professor of surgery at Case Western Reserve School of Medicine. I am the surgeon in chief at Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital. I am uh, the Robert I. Zant Professor of Surgery at Rainbow and the 53rd President of the American Pediatric Surgery Association. I currently work at the nexus of academia, clinical surgery, medical education, public health, leadership development, and social justice as a practicing pediatric surgeon. I endeavor to invest my academic, my clinical, and my service efforts to inspire individuals and to transform communities at the precipice of hope. I am a passionate advocate for child health and child health care in one of the greatest cities in America, but also one of the most distressed cities. I am so delighted to kind of if you will, share the podium of sorts with Dr. Satcher, but I don't deserve even to be in the shadow of this PowerPoint for this great man, much less be recognized at the same time. Um, I am so immensely humbled to join you. Can I have that? Uh, and so I, I show this. <laughs> and for those of you who may have Southern roots, you may know that this is a turtle on a lamppost. And what do you say when you see a turtle on a lamppost? It didn't get there on its own. <laughs> and so with all homage to my grandmother who presented this and said this to me growing up, I stand before you today so immensely humbled at this opportunity to be recognized. Uh, Dr. Satcher, for a long period of my career, has been someone I have admired and has been a goal model. But I must say, though, in this role of professor of surgery here at Case, I would be remiss if I didn't pause at this moment to pay my debt of gratitude to the minority students, alumni, faculty, deans, who have in many ways paved the way for someone like me to sit on that lamppost. And so uh, I tell you thank you. But I would also have to say thank you to people uh, like Dean Robbins, the late Dean Robbins, and to Dr. Gerson, and to other faculty members who have been allies for many of us as we move forward to move in this world to create a, a world that not just creates health equity, but the term that I prefer is health justice. And so I'd like to tell you a story about Dr. Satcher, and I'm going to talk more about Dr. Satcher than myself. There are things about me online. Dr. Satcher and I both share Southern heritage from small towns, and those of us who grew up Christian and African American in the South were brought up not to self-aggrandize, uh, but, to, but to use, as my grandmother would say, is to use the mirror to re reflect the light and brilliance of others into the world and uh, that is important. But let me tell you a brief story uh, about him. Um, this is one that I heard from my sister who's a Case alum. Uh, she graduated from the undergrad and then physical therapy. Unfortunately, she's deceased. Um, she told me that when she was here, there was something known as pelvic rounds. And uh, pelvic rounds occurred in university hospitals in the 1960s in which the medical students would go through and examine women. And there is a story, I thought it was fable, but in his autobiography he listed where um, Dr. Satcher walked out of pelvic rounds because the women were exposed, all African American women, not treated with dignity and respect, and he was not going to participate. Uh, as you know, he's an activist. He, between classes, would go protest at City Hall here and he'd do things. But anyway, this might have gotten him kicked out of the medical school. And, uh, Dean Robbins called him in the next day or a few days later, and he thought he was going to get his walking papers. And what the dean told him was that, no, he wasn't going to leave. And in fact, other students left because of his action. And so what I saw from him and what I learned when I heard him speak in 2006 with my sister, a friend of his, that he was an activist. 
an advocate and a leader because his courage led others to follow and move forward. And the quote that I heard him say when I saw him in 2006 at a fundraiser for his leadership institute, I've written here, we need leaders who first care enough, leaders who know enough, leaders who have courage enough, and leaders who will persevere until the job is done. And so with that as a mantra in 2006, I made a critical career decision to move from academic success as a tenured professor of surgery at uh, the University of Pittsburgh with a lab in tumor immunology developing dendritic cell vaccines to come to Cleveland to move from success, academic success, to clinical significance and to pursue determining how we could study the social determinants of health in a way that would be meaningful for a city that bore the weight of these. And those of you who know me know that we've done such things in, in social determinants of health and violence, violence, including working in a grassroots fashion in the community to understand the public health problem of violence and not just understand it, create, uh, uh, generate solutions that may be helpful. We developed the Anti-Fragility Initiative, which now has been sorted with, uh, supported with $2.2 million of state funding as of last week in order to promote post-traumatic growth. Now, mind you, I'm a pediatric surgeon, and we see trauma, children who have been shot between the ages of 7 and 15. We see about 70 to 100 a year, and 20% will return within two years shot again. That is a major public health problem. And we're working to empower the community uh, by moving to get these kids in places where they can recover. We've also worked to empower the, the community toward health, working to get rid of the scourge of infant mortality. You probably know that the state of children in Cleveland is tough, highest infant mortality, highest child poverty rate, highest suicide rate. And we decided to move away from the ivory towers and to get into the schools, to get in the homes, the projects to work on this. And finally, one of my greatest passions is to educate leaders nationally. And we've established a program in the Society of Black Academic Surgeons. And one of my protégés, uh, Ayla Stanford, was just named the 23rd most influential uh, person on Forbes magazine for her work in the COVID crisis. So as I close, I, I end with a quote by, uh, by Dr. Satcher that I heard when I went to the event, and he said that life is filled with golden opportunities disguised as irresolvable problems. So as we move forward as a group, let us remember that turtle on the lamppost, but let us also remember that we have promises to keep and miles to go before we sleep. Thank you. <laughs> this is what happens when you leave a male surgeon to do something. <laughs> I forgot to introduce my colleague, Dr. Angelique Redis McCoy. Thank you so much, Dr. Barksdale. I knew when I saw that I was going to be following Dr. Barksdale that I, I can't follow that. So I'm just going to very quickly <laughs> introduce myself in my society, who also represents um, an illustrious person who has um, really contributed in massive ways to our university. So again, I'm Dr. Angelique Redis McCoy. I am a general pediatrician at the UH Ahuja Rainbow Center for Women and Children. And I'm also a case alum, a graduate of the class of 2001. Um, I represent, as the Dean of the Robinson Society, Dr. Frederick Robbins, who is of just an incredible um, spirit and his energy still remains here at Case. Dr. Robbins um, is perhaps best known for sharing the 1954 Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine for discovering a method of growing polio virus in a test tube. And that discovery ultimately led to the development of the polio vaccine, as well as um, work that led to the production of other vaccines as well. Dr. Robbins was a faculty member at the time of his prize and became the Dean of Case School of Medicine 
from 1966 to 1980. And then at that time went to serve as president of the Institute of Medicine nationally, but then returned back to Case where he served as Dean Emeritus and was just an amazing presence from what I hear. He used to just be visible, hanging out in the lounges, talking to students and teaching and just was thoroughly committed to education. Additionally, that commitment to education led to collaborations that he helped create with the government of Uganda and medical schools there and then also developed the Center for Adolescent Health here at Case, where he ultimately served as director. I did not mention he's also a pediatrician, so also very close to my heart. Um, Dr. Robbins, just really in the spirit of innovation, service, and education, represents the best of what Case indeed um, has to give and offer to our students today. So it is in that spirit that I have the absolute pleasure of introducing Dr. Walter Barone. Dr. Barone. Thank you and good morning. My name is Walter Boron. I'm the chair of the Department of Physiology and Biophysics and the Myers Scarpa professor and chair there and also distinguished university professor. I'm a native of Elyria, Ohio, about 30 miles to the west of here and a graduate of St. Louis University with a degree in chemistry. When I think back to Dr. Robbins, it's one heck of an act to follow with the this work on the development of polio virus uh, culture was done at a time when the uh, culture of mammalian cells was more than just an art form. And then on top of that, to be able to generate the large amounts of polio virus necessary to develop a vaccine is just an amazing accomplishment. And on top of that, being Dean and then later on making a major contribution uh, in uh, extending to Africa infectious disease uh, initiatives. And so when I think of Dr. Robbins, it's an amazing act to follow. My link to him was as a medical student at Washington University, an MD PhD student. My histology professor was not a relative of, of uh, Robbins, but rather the son of Enders. So that Nobel Prize was shared by Enders, Willers, and, and Robbins. And I was fortunate enough to have as my uh, histology professor the uh, son of Enders. So while I was a medical student, one of my research projects was to understand the effect of intracellular pH on potassium channels and nerve cells. We worked with squid giant axons because back in those days you had to be working on very large cells. And we exposed these cells to a solution that contained carbon dioxide and bicarbonate. And the high level of CO2 is akin to what happens in our bodies with respiratory acidosis when the CO2 level goes up and the blood becomes acidic except in this case, the carbon dioxide on the outside of the cell crosses the cell membrane, enters the cell, and if we measure pH with a microelectrode inside the cell, you see that the pH inside the cell goes down. That's respiratory acidosis inside the cell. People had seen that decades earlier, but what we discovered is that the pH of the cell slowly recovered due to an active transport process, which basically takes up baking soda into the cell. This was the first demonstration of the active regulation of pH uh, in any kind of a cell and led eventually to the description of this transporter. I later on went to Yale University as a postdoctoral fellow where we discovered something called the sodium bicarbonate co-transporter named NBC, not to be confused with the broadcasting network. And NBC uh, eventually uh, was followed, the discovery was eventually followed by the cloning of the DNA that encodes the NBC and that led to the discovery of many other family members related to these bicarbonate transporters. And these are critical for the secretion of hydrogen ions in into the urine of the uh, by the kidney and therefore whole body pH regulation and pH regulation throughout the body. While studying pH regulation, we made the accidental discovery that when we exposed uh, gastric gland cells to carbon dioxide, the carbon dioxide could not penetrate the membrane of the gastric gland cell that faces the lumen of the stomach. This was the first demonstration of a CO2 impermeable membrane and then led to the discovery of the first gas channel, this channel for CO2. That very first channel was aquaporin-1, which has another link to Case Western Reserve University. Peter Agre shared the 2003 Nobel Prize for discovering the aquaporins 
These are tetramers, like four donuts on a plate. The water goes through the four donut holes, and what we are discovering is that the gases go through the middle of the four donuts. And currently what we've, and our colleagues have learned, is that these channels, the aquaporins and the RH proteins and some other gas channels, are responsible for 90% of the CO2 and oxygen movement across the red blood cell membrane. And in mice, when you knock these channels out, indeed the maximal oxygen consumption of the mice go down, but quite surprisingly, their ability to exercise goes up. So somehow these mice have been metabolically reprogrammed to be able to uh, use less oxygen to produce the same amount of ATP as a normal mouse. And this may become important in the future as treating uh, heart failure patients who have a difficult time sometimes delivering oxygen to their bodies. Perhaps a drug could be developed that would help uh, mimic what we see in these knockout mice. Uh, models and thereby enable them to exercise more and thereby extend their quality and quantity of their life. And if anybody out in the audience knows of someone who would like to help support this research, we would certainly love to talk to you. Uh, in addition to the research, I'm the chairman, of course, of the Department of Physiology and Biophysics. When we came here, we began to develop uh, a number of initiatives within the department. We're now well known uh, throughout the country for our work on structural biology of membrane proteins, such as sodium channels and various other kinds of uh, ion channels that are important in the nervous system and also viruses, some of the viruses that Dr. Robbins would be interested in. We also are now developing an interest in aerospace physiology, so we go from uh, atomic resolution all the way up to the whole human being. We also have developed a master's program in medical physiology designed for youngsters who didn't quite get into medical school or dental school the first time around. We now matriculate 175 students per year. About 40% of these students are underrepresented minorities. And across all demographics, 90% of those who apply are now getting into medical school or another professional school. So we're quite proud of that. In addition, I represent the Council of Basic Science Chairs uh, as the so-called executive director of PhD programs. This is a liaison that helps the basic science chairs and their faculty interact and cooperate with the PhD programs at the School of Medicine. And we also are innovative in helping uh, Amy Wilson DeFoss uh, teach a little bit of basic science physiology to the third year medical students in the SAMI curriculum. In addition, I've also served at the national and international levels as the chair, uh, the president, I should say, of the American Physiological Society and secretary general of the International Union of Physiological Sciences. I also have been editor of a couple of major journals, and one of the editorships I'm most proud of is our textbook of medical physiology, which is used here at Case and around the world. It's a leading medical physiology textbook and found uh, serves as the basis of our program uh, uh, in our medical physiology program here at Case Western Reserve University. So I thank you very much for your attention. I feel like this is more than enough about me. I'm feeling embarrassed talking. I'd much rather talk about one of the other society representatives but I'd like for that to introduce Steve Riccanati, who is going to talk about the next society. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Boron, Dr. Gerson, esteemed colleagues. I am Stephen Riccanati. I'm a 95 grad of the School of Medicine. I'm an internist at Metro Health Medical Center. I'm the founding dean of the Joseph Warren Society. You know, it's funny how when I started off in the academic societies with Bob Haney and Kent Smith and Lisa McKinley, and then all of a sudden you find yourself the last remaining <laughs> person standing. So obviously, all, all the societies are equal and they're all special, but my view of the world is Wern-centric. Let me tell you a little bit about Joseph Trelor Wern, born in Charlotte, North Carolina on February 15th, 1893. He earned his Bachelor of Science from Davidson College and then the MD at Harvard Medical School, after which he served as a first lieutenant in the US Army in World War I. He's a resident at the Peter Bent Brigham and he had his first faculty position um, as an instructor in the Department of Pharmacology at University of Pennsylvania under A.N. Richards doing a micropuncture 
of frog glomeruli. Now, I know, Dr. Boron, you will want to claim him as a physiologist, but I think it is an interesting thing that he always considered himself as a pharmacologist, which has a nice connection with our honoree today. He then served as an assistant and associate professor at Harvard Medical School, coming to be professor of medicine at Western Reserve and internist in chief at Lakeside Hospital, appointed dean of the School of Medicine in 1945 to 19. 59. But I think what most of us know Dr. Wern about, and from the dots you can connect from his day to our day currently, is the 1952 WR1 curriculum, which taught medicine as interrelated concepts rather than isolated subjects, instructed by committees made of diverse faculty rather than individual departments. He assigned first-year students to participate in the care of a pregnant woman and had a sensitivity to patients' social and economic situations, all while emphasizing the student as junior colleague, which is the foundation of the academic society. It gives me great pleasure to introduce today's honoree, Dr. Amy wilson Delfoss, Professor of Pharmacology and the Associate Dean for Curriculum. Thank you, Steve, for setting the stage of just how important Dr. Wern was to this School of Medicine. He is the origin of so much that we hold dear in, in our medical education program and in our relationships with students. I'd like to share some of the major contributions that Dr. Wern made to our school and how these contributions have impacted my time here at Case Western. First, Dr. Wern was brilliant in surrounding himself with good people. His thinking was clearly influenced by his professional hero, um, Dr. Francis Peabody, who was a humanist scientist and blended scientific inquiry and human relations in the care of his patients. And as it relates to curriculum, Dr. Warren made a particularly important addition to his faculty when he recruited Dr. Hale Hamm from Harvard and put him in charge of the 1952 curriculum reform. Dr. Hamm was the sort of person who loved learning and teaching and people and really brought an inspiring, fresh perspective to medical education at Western Reserve. I myself have been incredibly fortunate in my career here at Case Western to have also been surrounded by amazing people. My colleagues in the Department of Pharmacology supported me, particularly during the early part of my career when I was mentoring graduate students in my laboratory and really just breaking into the medical education scene. Dr. John Meal was a wonderful altruistic mentor to me during this time. And Dr. Robert Daroff gave me my first really significant opportunity at a leadership position in medical education in 2004 when he appointed me to oversee the basic science curriculum, which at that time really was limited to the first two years of the educational program. Dr. Terry Walpaw became my medical education mentor that I learned so much uh, of what I know about curriculum development and curriculum reform from. And we worked together as a small team of faculty to plan the Western Reserve II curriculum that was implemented in 2006. And in 2014, Dr. Patricia Thomas, lead editor of the very well-recognized Bible on Curriculum Development, became our vice dean for medical education and gave me a basic scientist by training, a shot at directing our four-year medical education program as associate dean. And as if the mentoring gifts never end, we now have Dr. Leo Logio, our vice dean, who is teaching me things about leadership I never knew I didn't know, and positioning our medical education program to take the next big steps forward. 
prior to the Western Reserve II curriculum of 1952, the teaching faculty had somewhat of a reputation for a bit of a hostile manner towards students. It was under Dean Wern's leadership that this faculty behavior changed and the concept of students as junior colleagues was born. When I was recruited here as an assistant professor in the Department of Pharmacology in 1998, I still remember Dr. Chuck Hopple pulling me aside in the hallway of the pharmacology department to explain the treasured concept of students as junior colleagues. He wanted to be sure that I understood the expected relationship between faculty and students. But I'll be honest with you, I did not see this kind of relationship between faculty and students in the classroom, and I didn't understand it. It was not until we launched the Western Reserve II curriculum that renewed our commitment to so many of the guiding principles of Wern's 1952 curriculum that I truly experienced faculty and students as colleagues in teaching and learning. My decade-long tenure as a case inquiry small group facilitator, my experiences working with students on medical education research projects, and my work with students to improve and build curricula serve to continually reinforce my understanding and value of students as junior colleagues. Dr. Wern broke down the silos of a, of a departmentally based medical education curriculum. When he was first appointed as dean in 1945, he put out a memorandum in which he said, a thorough reevaluation of the curriculum is essential with a view to improving the quality, efficacy, and coordination of the teaching. This will necessitate eradication of the sharp line now existing between clinical and preclinical years and a close integration of all departments in teaching. It was from these comments that the Oregon system curriculum that has been adopted by so many schools emerged. This concept of integration of faculty and integration of disciplines has in many ways formed much of the focus of the last 15 years of my career as a medical educator. As part of the Western Reserve II curriculum, we took the integration of faculty and departments that was required of the organ system curriculum to the next level by integrating multiple disciplines within the same course to present a more realistic and holistic view of health and disease as experienced by real patients. And a particular passion of mine has been to integrate basic science and clinical education toward an end goal of supporting decisions that result in safe, effective, and high value care for patients. I again have been incredibly fortunate to work with amazingly talented colleagues in, in, in medical education here to integrate the teaching and learning of basic clinical and health system sciences. And at a national level have spent the last nine years working with colleagues from the International Association of Medical Science Educators and the nonprofit health professions education company, Aquifer to create a clinically relevant national curriculum in basic science and evidence-based pedagogical approaches that are designed to promote cognitive integration of basic science and clinical medicine. I am incredibly grateful to have had a career for so many years that has blended scientific inquiry and medical education curriculum development and leadership. I feel so honored to be here today representing the legacy of Dr. Joseph Wern and thank Dean Gerson for the opportunity to speak. I truly look forward to the next decade of amazing work yet to come as we continue to learn and create with our junior colleagues. Thank you. And it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Marjorie Greenfield. Good morning. So I'm Marge Greenfield. I'm an OBGYN. I graduated from Case Western in 1983. 
Uh, and I am the inaugural dean for the Geiger Society, which was an expansion team that started in 2017. Uh, we actually had the opportunity to name the society and went through different people that were affiliated with CASE as prior faculty or graduates, and I was really, really happy with the choice of Dr. Geiger. I actually got to meet him. Uh, he um, lived about uh, eight blocks from where I grew up in Brooklyn, and I went to visit him and got his permission uh, to name our society after him. Um, Dr. H. Jack Geiger is a physician, was a physician and social activist. Uh, he went to reserve, we don't call it case, um, and he really credits the flexibility of the curriculum and the concept of the student as junior colleague with supporting his explorations when he was a student here. Uh, he had the opportunity to go to South Africa and to see how the community clinics there worked, uh, and he learned a lot about taking care of the underserved. Um, it's kind of amazing that he actually was involved in founding two organizations that got Nobel Prizes, Physicians for Social Responsibility and Physicians for Human Rights. Uh, and then in his work, in his clinical work, he developed a model for community health clinics uh, that really has spread through the country and now serves millions of families. Um, he, when I got to meet him, he was born in 1925, he died in 2020. Uh, when I got to meet him, one of the things that was so wonderful was that he was not only interesting, but also interested. And he was still wanted to know what our students were like and uh, what the school was like and how we were going to take his social activism and move it forward. Um, I am really happy to introduce Dr. Heidi Gullett. Um, I'm sure he would be so happy that she was chosen to represent the continuation of his work and values. Thank you so much, Dr. Greenfield. Um, I am Heidi Gullett. I'm an associate professor in the Center for Community Health Integration here at CASE. And um, the fact that anyone would think that my career remotely reflects any part of Dr. Geiger's is so absolutely humbling. Um, I am really grateful to be here today, especially with all of um, these other amazing faculty. And um, Dr. Geiger is really an inspiration to me and has been for some time. I only wish that I could have met him in person, but I, I live with his spirit um, and all that he did as, as inspiration every day. Um, I was born in Youngstown, Ohio, just uh, a little over 60 miles from here in the, in the city. And as a young child in the 80s, I realized that the impact of the social condition really is profound in the quality of people's lives. I grew up just a few miles from the steel mills, which had shut down, and saw the impact of unemployment and also the impact of segregation in the city of Youngstown, which at the time I didn't understand as a child, but was redlined and was intentionally segregated. And so that was really um, my childhood, was really my first introduction to seeing the impact of the social condition on people's lives and the quality of their lives. So that coupled with a desire to understand how the world works, I. I think that I drove my family crazy as a child. I always wanted to understand why things work the way they work and why complex systems were the way they were. And I think they got tired of trying to explain them to me. Um, but it was evidenced by me bringing home a cow brain and a spinal cord after a dissection in school at one point, put it in a paper bag so my mom didn't know. And eventually she discovered it. I, was, I kept dissecting it to learn more about it. And she eventually discovered it when it started smelling in the basket of my bicycle. So like those are the things that drove me to really understand, OK, what is it about the world? And what is it about health? That, you know, what makes people healthy, both the, the anatomical and the physiology pieces, but also that social context in which people live? So I went on to undergrad at Denison University here in Ohio and did a, a biochemistry degree, but pretty quickly realized that that was satiating my desire to understand complex systems at a molecular level, but it certainly wasn't helping me understand the social condition. So I pursued additional um, uh, minor in sociology and anthropology and met some incredible mentors that really helped me begin to kind of put those pieces together. And that led me to realize that I needed to pursue a career in public health, which also makes me so incredibly happy to be in the presence of Dr. Gerberding, who's been an inspiration as a strong female public health leader for all of my career. 
So I went on to medical school at uh, Wright State, which was founded with a focus on primary care education and community health, uh, training community health physicians. And again, met some incredible mentors there and ultimately decided, um, I, you know, learned a lot about social determinants of health. I think they were just starting to kind of understand what that was um, as far as teaching it in medical education. It wasn't an explicit part of our education, but there were a lot of electives and I worked with some incredible people working in community health centers there that helped me understand these um, issues and why they mattered for our patients. So I went on to be inspired to do a combined residency in public health, preventive medicine, and family medicine out in Oregon. Had never been to the West Coast, didn't know what it was like, but that was really the only place I could do that combined training and ended up uh, pursuing a master's in public health as part of that training and realized that was the sweet spot in finding the combination of how to best care for individuals and the population and to address the social condition in a way that really helps everyone have an opportunity to live their fullest and best lives. So during residency, um, I also worked at a Medicaid managed care company, which helped me begin to understand how you f use finite resources in a really complicated population to make sure people's needs were met. We had 100,000 members all on Medicaid and we had very limited resources, but we were at the beginning of healthcare reform in Oregon. So I began to learn how to think about populations very differently. And that was a real pivotal time in my career um, in finishing before I went on to the National Health Service Corps and worked in a rural practice. Um, full spectrum, I did you know, obstetrics, which on the West Coast, family docs trained to do obstetrics. So I did surgical obstetrics and love women's health and um, spent a while in rural practice and then eventually came back to Youngstown to serve just a couple miles from where I was born and where I grew up. And for the, the last uh, 14 to the last 17 years of my career have been in community health centers. And that link, you know, I, I, I can only do that because of Dr. Geiger. Like Dr. Barksdale said, you don't get onto the top of that pole by yourself, right? It's because of visionaries like him bringing back the community health center model that people like me can work in community health centers that now serve more than 25 million people in this community or in this country. More than one in every 12 patients is served by an FQHC in this community. And we don't just provide a little bit of primary care, we provide comprehensive services in addressing the social context. So that has led me um, back here to CASE 10 years ago, and I had the privilege of joining the medical education team and was mentored by uh, Dr. Wilson Delfoss and many others, including Dr. Thomas, and was able to bring some of that learning about the social condition into the classroom um, and begin to think about what that means for our students, whether they choose to do one specialty or another, I want them all to understand the social condition and why we need to really care about people's context as much as we care about their health outcomes. So throughout the time I've spent here in medical education, I have learned a lot, absolutely, um, realized the impact you can have on the next generation of physicians. And I think that is something that Dr. Geiger, I read an article about when you met with him, um, Dr. Greenfield, and he said that, um, let me get it right, uh, what are the students doing to make the world a better place? And I hope that I can carry on that legacy with our students here and doing that um, every day. One last piece I really wanna highlight um, that Dr. Geiger means a lot to me is that he was um, very committed to using his privilege as a white physician to become an ally and to make sure that in particular he fought against anti-black racism in a structural way, in an interpersonal way, and that he inspired those around him to do that. And so about eight years ago, I was um, very fortunate for um, Dean Davis to place me at the Board of Health and uh, the Population Health Liaison role. And that has led to my opportunity to work in a community health improvement planning here in the county. And I have met some incredible partners that have been focused on addressing structural racism here. And they have taught me about being an ally and taught me about what that means to use my privilege as a white physician to understand what we need to do to change the context in which people live, to address poverty, to address racism, and all of the things that lead people to have inequitable opportunities. So with that, I would like to say that um, I'm so incredibly honored to be with you. Thank you so much for thinking of me, but if I can channel Dr. Geiger for the rest of my career, I hope that he will continue to be an inspiration for all of those that I have the privilege of interacting with. So thank you so much for this opportunity. And at this point, I'm gonna introduce Dr. Gerson again. Uh, all 
I can say is you guys are an incredible hard act to follow. Um, I'm really appreciative of our opportunity today to bring this group forward and to reinvest, if you will, in the identity of the academic societies. And each of our faculty has um, managed beyond my wildest expectations for aligning with and recognizing the value of these academic societies and their namesake. And I will um, I'll go off script for a second uh, based on what uh, Heidi, uh, Walter, and a couple of others uh, presented uh, this morning. I was in the midst of a conversation at the National Academy of Medicine where I'm on a coordination committee for uh, uh, topics and workshops in cancer. And I suggested out of the blue when they accepted that uh, a spring 2023 symposium will be on the biologic effectors of the social determinants of health. How do you go from these incredible impacts on our well-being to the biology of disease, something we really don't understand yet. And I may call on a couple of you to come and think that through and present at that workshop. So back to our schedule. So I'm delighted to introduce the Sixth Society, which is brand new, which is the Gerberding Society, Julie Gerberding's uh, uh, dedication to advanced medicine and medical education is reflected in her commitment as a graduate to Case Western Reserve. As a trustee and close advisor to many of us, she provides a unique perspective and knowledge base that is really unmatched. Um, and as you'll hear, Dr. Gerberding's remarkable career has brought much pride to her alma mater. Um, and we could think of no one more fitting um, to honor her than to name one of our beloved societies after her. And this is really the, the goodwill uh, effort of our Vice Dean for Education, Leah Logio, who I charged with sort of figuring out what we should do when she came back. It was very clear uh, with that um, process. Uh, so it's my honor to introduce uh, Jason Lambrise, who serves as the inaugural Gerberding Society Dean, and he'll tell you more about Dr. Gerberding, and then we'll hear from Dr. Gerberding yourself. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Jason Lambrizi. I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist at the Cleveland Clinic. And it's uh, really fitting that I'm here speaking with you today. My first official act as dean this summer was the first day of orientation, and I was standing up here at this podium talking with all the students and welcoming them to our brand new sixth, at that point, unnamed society. And when the students and I learned that our society would be named after Dr. Gerberding, we're all really excited and honored. And so I'm really happy to be here today introducing her to you. Dr. Gerberding received her bachelor's degree from Case Western Reserve in 1977 and her medical degree in 1981. She completed her internship and residency in internal medicine and a fellowship in clinical pharmacology and infectious disease at the University of California, San Francisco, and earned a master's in public health at the University of California, Berkeley. She's currently an adjunct associate clinical professor of medicine and infectious disease at both UCSF and here at CWRU. In addition to being an esteemed double alumna, Dr. Gerberding is Executive Vice President and Chief Patient Officer of Strategic Communications, Global Public Policy, and Population Health at Merck. She is responsible for the Merck for Mothers Program and the Merck Foundation. As Chief Patient Officer, Dr. Gerberding leads efforts to engage with patients and patient organizations to help inform the company's decision-making processes. She's building new initiatives designed to accelerate Merck's ability to contribute to improved population health, a measure increasingly valued by consumers, health organizations, and communities. As a world-renowned infectious disease and public health expert, Dr. Gerberding is well-versed in and passionate about acting with purpose and urgency to meet patient needs. She joined Merck in January 2010 as president of Merck Vaccines and helped make the company's vaccines increasingly more available and affordable to people in emerging markets and in some of the most resource-limited countries in the world. She's helped lead the successful launch in India of the MSD Wellcome Trust Hillman Laboratories, a not-for-profit joint venture for vaccine development. Earlier in her career, Dr. Gerberding held a tenured faculty appointment at the University of California, San Francisco, where she directed the Prevention Epicenter, a multidisciplinary research, training, and clinical service program that focuses on the prevention of infections in patients and their healthcare providers. 
1998, she left academia to lead the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Division of Healthcare Quality Promotion, and in 2002, she was appointed the CDC's first female director, a post she held until 2009. Dr. Gerberding led the CDC through more than 40 emergency responses to public health crises, including anthrax, SARS, natural disasters. She's also advised governments around the world on urgent issues such as pandemic preparedness, AIDS, antimicrobial resistance, tobacco, and cancer. She's a member of the National Academy of Medicine and a fellow of the Infectious Disease Society of America and the American College of Physicians. Dr. Gerberding currently serves on numerous boards and advisory committees and has received more than 50 awards and honors, including the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Distinguished Service Award for her leadership in response to the anthrax, bioterrorism, and September 11th attacks. She was named to Forbes Magazine's 100 Most Powerful Women in the World in 2005 through 2008 and to Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People in the World in 2004. So as news of a novel coronavirus in China began appearing in the U.S. and media in January 2020, she was among the first experts that outlets like NPR and NBC News contacted for her insight. Her knowledge and perspective have continued to be in demand ever since. She's authored a piece in Time Magazine regarding the need for global pandemic surveillance and appeared in the New York Times Magazine story about can the CDC be fixed, was quoted by Bloomberg regarding the potential need for vaccine boosters, and meanwhile, this spring, Merck entered a historic partnership to manufacture more of the J&J &J COVID-19 vaccine, which should help double production by the end of the year, and is pursuing a novel antiviral medicine that can help prevent serious complications in related hospitalizations. Certainly a really important uh, next step in fighting the pandemic. So Dr. Gerberding, I can only help to hope to inspire our students uh, with the strength and fortitude, resilience and determination you've brought to your career and to the field of medicine. Uh, we have dubbed ourselves the Gerberdingers and we are really excited to have you here today with us. So join me in welcoming Dr. Gerberding. Thank you for that. My father would be so amazed to hear that. <laughs> uh, I am overcome with humility here. Um, I love the turtle on the fence post, and I feel like I've been on a series of fence posts my whole life, but a lot of the people who hoisted me up there um, were from this university, so thank you. Um, I was asked to say a few things about my career and how it evolved and emerged, and you know that's a that's a complicated and um, ongoing story, I hope. But I, I will say that um, one of the things that I have started to think a lot about as I've matured in my profession is really my core values and what were kind of the um, the underpinnings that led me to make certain decisions or to evolve my career in so many different zigzag patterns through the years. Um, I really did know when I was four years old that I wanted to be a doctor. Someone gave me a doctor kit for Christmas and my parents um, didn't discourage that even though I think my father was a little bit skeptical that girls didn't really become doctors. Um, that was not something that was used as a quenching mechanism in my household. So from a very early age, I had a commitment to a purpose. And I knew that somehow the fact that I was the one in the neighborhood that collected the blind rabbit or the bird with the broken wing, wing or took in all those stray animals that my parents could tolerate, that I had an overactive empathy gene. And the best thing to do with that was, was to think about it, the healing profession of medicine. So I was very serious about it. Um, but I also um, was curious, and I had that same passion for trying to understand everything. We lived in a tiny little rental house in rural South Dakota, and the basement of the house was full of mold, so we couldn't use that space at all. But it was a perfect laboratory. And so I had a microscope there, and then I started my entomologic expeditions, collecting bugs and pulling them apart and examining them. Then I got a chemistry set, which believe me, in those days was dangerous. Um, you can't get those anymore, but I'm surprised I didn't blow the house up. And when I came here and was a chemistry major, I found how many risks I'd actually been taking. 
So um, that really just increased my conviction that the healing art and science was for me. In seventh grade, my little school had a career day, and one of the things they gave away was a book called literally, So You Want to Be a Doctor. And included in the book were a number of chapters about the different medical schools around the, com the country, including Western Reserve. And Western Reserve was described as a school that had an integrated curriculum. So it really um, went through what we've already heard from Amy about the concept of, uh, of, of a vertical approach to learning, not a, a I mean, a horizontal approach to learning, not a vertical approach to learning, and that concept of not taking anatomy and pharmacology and so on and so forth separately, but thinking about the organ systems, having um, the socialization of a physician beginning the first week of school with the assignment to a, a young woman with early stage pregnancy, all of that just completely appealed to my intellectual model, and that was it. I knew I wanted to go to medical school at Western Reserve college, and it seemed to me that the best way to get into medical school here was to go to undergrad here. And so that became my next purpose in life, and I really reoriented how I approached high school. I was a student in a, in a very good but very small rural school, but my parents um, allowed me to commute to a larger school in our state even though we had to pay tuition and my father was on the school board of the small school, it really was kind of a tense decision process, but I was able to graduate from a larger school that had chemistry and biology and advanced courses because I wanted to make sure I had a good chance of getting into this university. And I did, and, but I only had a scholarship for the first year. And it was expensive for my family and financial aid was helpful, but not a guarantee. So I thought I could only be here for one year. So I went to Dr. Foreman, who's now passed, but she was professor of physiology in the biology department. I was taking her course, um, and I asked her if I could uh, take her advanced endocrinology course the second semester because I didn't think I could come back to take it in the normal period as a sophomore or junior. And she said, why wouldn't you come back? And I explained to her the situation, and she said, sit down. And so I sat in her office for more than an hour, and she came back an hour later and said, you will have the support you need. So that was um, a very, um, a very inspiring and emotional experience because that was here. That's this university. And that's why I'm here today. So let me get over that for a minute. Um, I was uh, then, of course, very preoccupied with how could I get into medical school. So Dean Horrigan was the dean at the time. And he had a very, uh, for those of you who interviewed with him, you know he had a very unusual style of interviewing. So. Um, he had a rocking chair in his office, and I was called to interview because I was on campus and somebody else um, had scheduled at, at that time had, had canceled their interview, so they called me up on short notice. I was wearing college student clothes, not interview clothes. So I'm in jeans and, you know, regular outfit for a student at the time, sitting in his rocking chair, and he, he started the conversation talking to me about high school band. I'm thinking, why are we talking about high school band? And he was just really looking for a way to relax and have a conversation about something other than um, the tension of, of trying to be a good interview subject. And I, um, you know, settled down, relaxed a little bit, and, you know, he asked me a few important questions. And then at the end, he stood up and he said, well, as you know, you know, we have... I don't know, 6,000 applicants for 130 positions. And, you know, it's very competitive, and I'm, my heart is sinking. And then he said, but I think we can guarantee that you'll get a letter of acceptance next month. <laughs> <laughs> you just couldn't imagine what that was like. I flew out of there so fast. I went to see Dr. Foreman, the professor who had helped me. So I was working in her lab at the time. And, you know, I was just so overjoyed. And, you know, every time I come back to this campus, I remember that moment because it was, you know, it was a dream. So, you know, I went to school here. I went to the University of California, uh, San Francisco at the beginning of the AIDS epidemic. And I thought I was going to be an endocrinologist when I started my residency. But as it turned out, I became an infectious disease doctor for obvious reasons. But I think what happened um, at 
in my heart and in San Francisco at that time was that was the moment when I realized that medicine was more than healing a patient. That's when I realized that we were here not just to deal with the end of one, but we had to deal with medicine in the context of the community. The stigma and disparities and, and issues in the social context of HIV are known to everyone, but when you're a young doctor and all your patients are dying, it's excuse me, it's pretty important to recognize the context in which they're living their lives and the tremendous discrimination and, and the experiences that they had and the countless stories of patients whose families didn't know that they were gay or who were struggling with mental health and substance use disorders at the same time they were dealing with this fatal illness. You couldn't help but move from the bedside into the community and recognize that we had to find ways to be more relevant and to do more and to deal with the whole issue of health equity. So that, you know, that spirit was born inside of me and I won't go into all the chapters of that part of the story, but suffice to say that made me absolutely commit to going to UC Berkeley to get my master's in public health because I knew that I had to be able to do more than, than be at the bedside. And of course, then that chapter led me to the CDC, originally, as you heard, in healthcare quality. But one of the great things about um, CDC at the time is they were working on this concept called One Health. And maybe some of you know that's the, the juxtaposition between animal health, human health, and, and ecology. And guess where we are today in the middle of a pandemic? That is the juxtaposition between ecology, humans, and animals. And um, that integration theme that was the thing that drew me to CWRU in the first place is just continuing to play out in my life over and over again. And it actually has informed the way I lead when I'm responsible for organizations because I, I really believe in the wise crowd. I, I think that integrative learning, that um, shared curriculum, the bringing together of people across disciplines, um, across layers of experience, across diverse um, attributes across diverse geographies, you get much better decisions if you have a wise crowd in the room. And that concept of planning horizontally and executing vertically is something that I have really tried to exemplify for the teams that I've been part of, but also to um, encourage and instill in others. It's, it's, we, we're not in a, a, a solo performance sport. We are definitely in a team sport. And the more we can remember that, the more likely we are to find solutions to the really incredibly complex problems that we're facing right now. So I, I, I think that really, um, that pattern of recognizing the commitment to a purpose, the recognition that that purpose had to be bigger than the bedside, for me at least, although I'm still the chief patient officer and I still do attend at San Francisco General Hospital. Um, and, and then the recognition that to really solve some of these problems requires the convergence of a wise crowd of cross-disciplinary approaches. Um, really helped me when I was trying to decide if it was a good idea to go to a pharmaceutical company or not. And I was attracted to accept the position at Merck, one part because the leader at the time, Mr. Ken Frazier, who is an African-American iconic leader who really leads from his core values, said to me, listen, we have some really great vaccines in this company, but they're not reaching the people in the world who need them the most. How would you like to come and try to help us globalize access to HPV cancer prevention? Like, who could say no to that? But the other reason that I ended up at Merck is more of a case Western Reserve story because Dr. Adil Mahmood, who had been chairman of medicine here for several years, left CWRU and became the president of Merck Vaccines. So when he retired, which at that time you had to retire when you were 65 at Merck, Adil called me up while I was at the CDC and he said, well, I know your next job. And I said, well, what would that be? And he said, you're going to be the president of Merck Vaccines. And I said, well, I am certainly not working for a pharmaceutical company. <laughs> and he said, well, just come and talk to them and you know, see what you think. So that led to the conversation with Mr. Frazier. And with Otto's support and championship, um, I settled into the new role. And I, I really did uh, make it my purpose there to do whatever we could to try to bring an HPV cancer uh, vaccine to people in the poorest countries of the world. And I'm pleased to say that several millions of doses later, we are becoming very successful in contributing to the elimination program that someday I hope will become a reality. 
But I, I, I say this because in the context of the society and the iconic people um, that you've been hearing about, both the, the, the people for whom the societies are named, but also the incredible faculty, you can see that I'm still a work in progress. So as, as, the, as the youngest, not necessarily chronologically, but the youngest um, per person included on this list, I probably have the most to learn and, and the most to continue to evolve. And that's fitting because I am an infectious disease doctor and uh, you all know how bacteria grow, right? Mm -hmm. 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, they stay in log phase. And if they find themselves going into stationary phase where they're no longer learning or growing, one of two things happens. They either die or they have to get in a bigger beaker or get fed with some new nutrient material. So I try to keep my whole life in the spirit of staying in log phase. And this opportunity to participate as a, a, a component of the, of the societies at the university is really a chance for me to refresh my log phase. And I really can't wait till I can meet students and have a chance to work with Jason and, and get to know them and, and try to be a mentor and a support of this incredible effort. This is a fantastic school. We're sitting in the metaphor of integration, in my view, here um, with the admixture of the various health professions that are here on this campus. And um, it's a privilege to have been a student here, but it's also a privilege to be able to come back and interact with so many incredible people. So thank you so much. Uh, Julie, that was uh, fantastic. I really appreciate your comments and uh, uh, a fitting, I think, expansion of our societies. And I've had a delightful morning uh, hearing from all of you and especially from uh, Julie. And I'll just remind, since I am a DNA repair person, that when they get to that plateau phase, they start to mutate. So they're <laughs> further evolving, just to, just to keep us all honest. Um, but we're all in that evolving stage. So um, I think it's been a terrific uh, session. I hope it's been recorded so that our students who are in classes now can, can take the opportunity to, to uh, hear from it. And I uh, will encourage us all to... Uh, let our friends know that this has been a fantastic uh, session for us all. So I really do appreciate the effort and the um, topics that all of you presented and commented on. I've learned a huge amount, uh, and this will be a um, hard act to follow. So thank you all. <laughs>